Let me pray for us and get us started. Father God, thank you for your amazing grace, God, that you are a God who uh, rejoices in uh, finding the one that was lost. And, um, and Father, we just pray that you would um, help us this morning to understand your word and that we might uh, rightly uh, see it for um, as you meant us to understand it and see your glory and the glory of your Son. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is where we are this week in, um, in the epistle of, that we call 2 Corinthians. We are in chapter 7. I say it's, uh, I changed the title a little bit to Repentance Unto the Love of the Apostle because um, this chapter has a lot about repentance as we'll see. So I, I, I like this, uh, this, ver- this uh, quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon that says, The communion of peace between you and Christ, while there is peace between you and sin. That's definitely true, Um, and and we'll we'll talk about that because this is where we are in in our journey. And to be quite honest, we are. um, It's this is you may not have kind of recognized this before about Second Corinthians, but really this is kind of the end of the the first and the main section because. The first seven chapters are really um, the first seven chapters are really about Paul's ministry, um, and and so chapter seven um, kind of wraps that up. And and actually, um, it, it's as we'll kind of see when we get to this point is that um, at at verse chapter two verse fourteen, he he's been talking about um, his concern and things he was doing and and his. Um, how he was working in Ephesus, and and then he and then he he makes an abrupt change and starts talking about the integrity of his ministry and the defense of that integrity, and he goes on all the way up until chapter four, uh, chapter seven, verse four, and then he picks up right where he left off. It left off, and so that's kind of like one big aside, you know, one big parenthetical. Step, but it's the bulk of the book, and it's really the point of his letter. Um, then the next two weeks will be chapters 8 and 9, which is about the collection, which is we, we learn a lot about giving. He talks about um, um, really what apostleship is and then his own, his own visit. And so that's, that's kind of the structure of the book a little bit. But that's kind of where we are is the end of this first section. So if you allow me, I'm going to read from the New American Standard uh, Translation, I believe it is, starting at verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf, and I'm filled with comfort. I'm overflowing with joy in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you. As he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing This godly sorrow has produced in you, 
What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you d demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So although I wrote to you, I was not, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but so that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. For this reason, we have been comforted. And besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. His affection abounds all the more toward you, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. End of chapter 7. If you remember in, in chapter 6, um, he has been appealing for them to return to him, to come back to him, to restore this relationship that they have broken. And then at verse 14 of chapter 6, then he begins, that's when he um, has the, uh, starts the section which is very well known, probably the most known uh, part of 2 Corinthians where he talks about um, being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And we talked about that a good bit last time. And, 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 and really his point was your spiritual bond with unbelievers in the church has led you astray from the truth. And you need to stop binding yourselves to these unbelievers. You need to break that relationship. And, 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 but he lays out why you sh the reason for the command to not be unequally yoked, he says, because it's irrational, it's sacrilegious. Remember he talks about you know, what, you know, what do the temple demons and the temples and the, and the church of Jesus Christ have in common, right? Because it's disobedient. Um, because, and remember he, he lays out all the commands in the Old Testament where God called for the Hebrews to come out and to be separate. And, um, and I say it's unbecoming as a father, and that's the last verse in chapter 6. And here in chapter 7, I say it's one of the reasons that you should not become unequally yoked with unbelievers is because it displays ingratitude. Ingratitude. What do you mean by that? Well, he says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the defilement of flesh and spirit. Okay, well, what? What promises is he talking about? Well, if you'll just look at the end there at chapter 6, these are the promises that God has laid out. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They should be my people. I welcome you. Be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me. Those are God's promises of intimacy and union with the people of God when they will separate themselves from sin. And... Uh, I also talk about how being unequally yoked is it's that doesn't mean you can't buy a mutual fund or you can't be in a you know fantasy football league with unbelievers or something. I mean, it's amazing the the lines that people draw. This is this is a spiritual endeavor, is what he's talking about. You can't be in a spiritual co-labor with unbelievers and expect that to be blessed. Expect that to, to be the work of God because that's what they were doing. So, since we have these promises, we should cleanse ourselves of all the defilement. You know, if you are truly thankful about everything that God has done for you and promises to do, to continue to do, it should affect your behavior today. It should change the way that you think and you act because you have a heart of gratitude. Um, this word for defilement, it's, um, it, it's, it's not just, it, it's kind of a specific word really for religious defilement, for um, uh, mixing falsehood and with truth when it comes to religion. 
Um, there, it's, it's, it's only used here in the New Testament, but it's used in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, in a few different places. So it's really alliances with false religion and heresy. They, they, they should not be mixed together. Um, yeah, I mean, you may have heard of, I guess the crassest example I can think of is, is uh, Santeria. If you've heard of Santeria, Santeria is kind of a Caribbean religion where they take some Catholicism and you take some voodoo and you mix them together and you get this, you get this uh, kind of half voodoo, half Catholicism type religion. Um, that's right, it's kind of get the worst of both, right? And, um, <clears throat> but that, but don't get me wrong, we have, there is mixture of, of false religion with uh, true religion that's a lot less overt um, in our own world, which is not as fringed, I would say, as something like that. There's a lot of non-Christian thinking involved in a lot of American Christianity, so-called. Um, but this idea of um, since God has, has made all these promise, promises, let us not mix false religion with it. And, and, and the way I like to think of this is like the, the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Um, God wants the truth that he has shown us to be the only um, truth that is before him. Um, that our, our, our worship and our, our spiritual lives are not to be mixtures of um, different things. So, then in verse 2 he says, um, make room in your hearts for us. Again, he's appealing for fellowship with them. This relationship that the Corinthians have broken. Um, the words here, wronged and corrupted, they have to do with um, leading someone into sin. We've wronged no one, we've corrupted no one, um, took advantage of is to take advantage of, to, to deceive someone for personal gain. And, but you kind of get the idea that he doesn't say um, no one has been wronged. He doesn't say no one's been corrupted or, or taken advantage of. You kind of get the idea he's saying someone's being led into sin, someone's being taken advantage of, but I'm not the one that's doing it. The idea is your false prophets are doing that to you. Um, and interesting here at the end, he says, as I said before, that you're in our hearts to die together and to live together. Okay? N notice the order there. Not usually the order we usually think of. We usually think of living and then dying, right? But that's not the Christian order. The Christian order here is dying and then living. We died ourselves. We died to sin. We live in Christ. And after we die, we will live again. Um, Paul faced death daily, but he knew that his bodily death was not going to be the end. Um, interesting here also that he says, um, He's, he has great confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf, probably not the least of which was to Titus that he talks about here at the end of this chapter. Um, but he's also overflowing with joy in the midst of his affliction, um, which is not usually the idea that we think about when we think about affliction and suffering. We usually don't think of somebody at the same time overflowing with joy. He doesn't deny that he's suffering. He doesn't say, oh, this is nothing. I'm not, I'm not really, no. He, if you remember at the beginning of the book, he was pretty plain that he was suffering greatly to the point where he had just given up. We're, we're all going to die, and it's going to be bad. And that's the way it is. But it's, and, and so he, he was, he'd given himself over to death. But he says he's overflowing with joy. Because... And the thing is, his circumstances were not the basis of his joy. 
His, his joy, his happiness did not depend on what was happening. He had uh, joy in Christ. Um, and so here's that point where he makes, that's the end of the parentheses that he started back in chapter 2, verse 14. Because in, in verse 13, he says, uh, I went on to Macedonia. And then he starts talking about his ministry for about five chapters. And then, um, verse 5 here in chapter 7, interesting, he picks up right where he lets, left off. But when we came into Macedonia, because <laughs> he had been in Ephesus before that, I'll remind you kind of how the story went. That he Remember, he founded the church in um, Corinth, for, and he was there for 18 months. And then he kind of, basically at, at some point he, he left and he went back to Jerusalem. And then he um, went on his third missionary journey, which he's on when he writes this. And part of that third missionary journey, he stops in the city of Ephesus. And he is in Ephesus when, um, right before he wrote this letter. But he was in Ephesus. You may remember how long he was in Ephesus? About three years. He's there for a long time. So, but during that three-year time, um, things in Corinth didn't go very well, and 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 obviously um, they're starting to become um, listening to people who are um, false teachers who are teaching falsehood, but also in order to teach their falsehood, they have to run down and get rid of the source of truth, which is Paul. And so they start saying bad things about Paul. And so Paul's relationship with them, even though distant, begins to decay. And at some point, and Paul's hearing about this, and we have 1 Corinthians where he wrote, um, that was the third really in a series of letters back and forth, but they still didn't respond really to the first Corinthian letter. And so at some point he left Ephesus on a quick trip, sailed across the Aegean Sea to went to Corinth. And when he got to Corinth, he had a, it was a bad visit, what he calls a sorrowful visit. And obviously when he was there, there was confrontation. And um, most likely it seems that there was one individual that confronted him personally and slandered him and ran him down. And, but the real problem was that the church did not come to his defense, that did not silence this man and did not correct him. And so Paul left and went back to Ephesus with a heavy heart. But before he left, he told them, you're going to have to deal with that man. You're going to have to discipline that man. And, um, and so he wrote, after he got back, he wrote what he calls the severe letter or the sorrowful letter. And, um, and in it, he basically laid out pretty plainly what their error was and strongly called them to repent. And he sent that with Titus back to Corinth. Titus carried that letter. And so after he sends that letter, he doesn't know. How are they going to respond? Are they going to continue to reject him or are they going to come back? And so while he's waiting, he apparently had arranged to meet Titus in, um, probably, I think it was Troas. And, um, and, and so he goes to Troas, he leaves Ephesus and probably at the appointed time or whatever, but goes there and he can't find him. And so then he leaves and he goes to Macedonia. Because he says, I'm, I'm going to go on the road. I'm going to go on, I'm, I'll just, maybe I'll meet him on, on the road walking. And so um, they end up meeting each other in Macedonia, probably in Philippi. Um, uh, a lot, there are some, there's some reasons why historians, historians think that this letter was written from Philippi. But that's probably where Titus and Paul ran into one another. And so he says here, um, he'd written a severe letter and given it to Titus, carried to Tor Corinth, went to Troas to meet Titus, couldn't find him. So he left Troas for Macedonia to find 
Titus. Um, but before he finds Titus, he's very upset because he doesn't. He's he's anxious. Are they going to? How are they going to receive this letter? Is it going to push them farther away, or is it going to cut them to the heart and they will come back to me? Is the relationship going to be further damaged, or is it going to be healed? That's what he is concerned about. And he's actually so concerned in verse 6 there, it says, God who comforts the depressed. Um, that's really his condition, is, is depressed. Um, the con- there are conflicts without fears within. The fears were in his heart about what's going to happen. The conflicts were with, um, with these false teachers who were... Um, who were opposing him and slandering him. Um, and this is a grieving pastor. This is a pastor who is grieving over the broken relationship with this beloved church, this church he loved. Remember, this is the church he founded. When he went to Corinth, there was nothing. There was not one Christian in the entire city. He founded this church. A God who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. In this chapter, he's going to use the word comfort six times. And he's going to use the word joy five times. Um, But he said he comforts the depressed. And this word for um, depressed is not just someone who's humble, but someone who's humiliated. This is the word that's also sometimes translated um, lowly. in, in Romans chapter 12, it says, associate with the lowly. Um, these are one, this is, and this can be lowly by emotional state or, or social state or economic. Um, but, that, but that is definitely God's predisposition, isn't it? Is to identify with the poor and the lowly. But that's what his position was. Said, so, but he was comforted not only by his coming, the coming of Titus, because he meets Titus and he is greatly um, comforted by Titus' arrival, but also with the comfort with which he was comforted in you. So he is excited because not only he, he finds Titus, and Titus is great to have a companion nonetheless, but also that Titus starts, then comes and gives him news about what it was like for him when he was in Corinth. Um, he says, um, this word for me, the way the, the Greek is, is apparently um, arranged, that for me goes with those three clauses. That he, he reported to us, your longing for me, your mourning for me, and your zeal for me. That goes with all three of those things. And so the longing for me, Titus reported the Corinthians, they yearn for a restored relationship with you. They yearn for that. They didn't before. They, you're mourning for me. They are mourning over their sin that they committed against you. And that was comforting to Paul. Um, and then lastly, your, your, your zeal for me. You know, zeal is um, it's an interesting word because it's not, it's not just excitement. It's, it's love for something and hatred for something because you love what is um, the object of your love and you also hate anything that's against it, right? Um, if you remember when it said the Lord Jesus that, he, that zeal for your house has consumed me, you remember that in the, in the Gospels? What, in what context did it say that, with Jesus that zeal for your house has consumed me? When he was sitting outside the door of the temple, braiding a whip to clear out the temple, like he, gets, like he said, because he loved the Lord's temple, but he also hated the, um, the assault of the holiness the temple. And so 
but that's zeal. It's love for something and hatred for what's against it. So he was comforted when Titus reported, you're longing for me, you're mourning for me, and your zeal for me. Um, so for although I caused you sorrow by my letter, I did not regret it, though I did regret it. Okay, did he regret it or did he not regret it? Which is it? Well, it... Um, Has, has, has any parent, is, is there a parent that has not spanked a child and then after you walk out of the room, you think, did, did I do it too hard? Did, did, was I too hard on the child? Or if ever you discipline somebody and, and you are eager for them to repent, let's say, and so you come down and you're hard on them and you're telling them strongly, what they're doing wrong and what they need to do to correct it. And then after, and they kind of, conversations ended and you go away and that night you're laying in bed going, was I too hard? Did, did, I, did I say too much? Did I push them further away? Or any, any wayward child or anything, that, that can often happen. And so you, you get a little bit ambivalent. To, I don't regret saying something, but boy, did I come down too hard. That's where, that's where Paul was. Because he was afraid, that, did I drive them further away? So I, I didn't regret it, but I did regret it. Um, and I have to say here, parenthetically, that really verses 8 through 16, to me, are some of the most beautiful verses in the Holy Testament about repentance. Because that's really what this is about, is repentance. And I think it's laid out so very well, as we'll see. Um, I rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. You were made sorrowful according to the will of God. It's, it's sad that in, in, modern, in modern talk about, about um, things of God, that Repentance among some evangelicals is, is really getting um, a, a bad rap. That's not, even, that's not even well put. It's getting said that repentance is really not even necessary. That, it's, um, that we don't want to make people feel bad. It's bad vibes. It's bad energy to, talk, to, to try to get people to feel sad about about, about their mistakes of the past. Definitely not true. Definitely not the recipe that God has for saving the lost. Because His recipe includes sorrow that leads to repentance. Um, is, is it enjoyable? I 100% will admit Godly sorrow at first is not enjoyable because it is sorrowful. Um, and the thing is, he was glad about their sorrow. And this is not glad about their sorrow like, I was right and you were wrong, and now I'm going to dance a little jig that I'm right. No, he, he, this, as, as he says several times, this is not about my offense. This is not about my feelings being hurt. Are you stepping on my toes? Um, and I like this. He says, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. That's why he was, that's why he was joyful. Because the thing is, if they're separated from him, they're going to suffer loss in their ministry, in their joy, in their blessing of their life they're going to lose out a lot. And so he, um, he rejoices that they will not suffer loss when they are restored to the truth. Um, but repentance is the work of God. That is a work of God in the heart of the unbeliever. And I would say continues to be in the heart of a believer. Um, but while it's the work of God, it's, it's not apart from um, the willingness of the individual. 
we respond to it and we um, we are the ones who actually do the repenting um, well, Michael, I yes say there, uh, the word conscience because what happens is uh, in the conscience we have to make a choice mm -hmm. of obedience or hardening our hearts right and so that's the word there okay Yes, it's yeah, yeah. You, your will is involved, definitely. Um, but the thing is, it says the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Okay, genuine repentance is not regretted later. Someone who genuinely repents will not look back on it five years ago ago. That was a waste of time. Remember when I went through that crazy phase? And, you know, and I stopped doing this, I stopped doing... No. Gentian repentance is without regret. Um, and repentance always includes sorrow. Think about that. Genuine repentance always includes sorrow. Genuine repentance is not... Well, I'll try to check out this this uh, Jesus thing for a little while. See how that works. Yeah, this other stuff, it kind of wasn't working out, so I stopped doing that. thought I'd look in. No. Genuine repentance always includes sorrow. If, it is, if, if repentance does not include sorrow, then the person doesn't understand the nature of sin. They don't understand how vile it is, how blameworthy it is, how repugnant it is how hateful it is. They don't understand, really what they don't understand ultimately is the holiness of God. Amen. That's what they don't understand. Um, so, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world produces death. Um, ungodly sorrow has no power to heal, has no power to transform, it has no power to save, it has no power to redeem. That's just someone that feels sorry that they got caught. Or feels sorry that how come I can't do this thing that I wanted to do and have nothing on my conscience about it later. I wish it wasn't like that. I wish I could sin and have a clear conscience about it. That's what, God, that's what ungodly sorrow is like. I wish I could sin without consequence. And the end of worldly sorrow is only death. There is no life that comes out of it. And verse 11 is, is to me, a, a pretty remarkable verse. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful picture, I think, of repentance, as we'll see. Um, and it described repentance as being rather intense. This is a this is a intense verse here. Um, I like how it starts off with "Behold." Behold is an explanation, an exclamation of um, surprise, of, of exhilaration. This is this is emotion and energy here. And, and notice he says what seven times. There are seven things here that he says. It says, what earnestness, what vindication, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. And in every one of these times, what is, is kind of a, it's a comparative word. Um, it, it's, it, he's, he's saying that each one of these things is to an elevated high level, a high degree in each one of these things. This isn't, he doesn't just say, um, godly sorrow produces earnestness. Does, it's what earnestness was, pro was produced in you. So looking at these seven things, number one is, is earnestness. Um, that uh, re true repentance uh, brings about um, an end to the indifference to sin. Because the unrepentance, they, they do have an indifference to sin. Big deal. It's not a big deal. With repentance, it is a big deal. 
There's earnestness about, about getting rid of sin. Um, it's a start of eagerness for righteousness. And so, secondly, is what vindication of yourselves. And, and, and this, this is like justifica- justification, but, and it's not necessarily um, trying... The, the point here is I no longer want to be associated with sin. I want this removed from my name. I want this removed from who I am. What indignation... Indignation is, it sounds, like a, it's, it sounds like a very fancy word, it's anger. This is really what this is, is, is kind of a deep, you've heard the, the, the phrase righteous indignation. Um, anger is what this is. It's, it's someone who's truly repentant is angry at the shame that you've brought on yourself. And you're, you're also angry at, at sin and everything behind it that kind of, sells it to you. Have you ever met someone who um, has recently quit smoking? People that have recently quit smoking or, or quit a bad habit, they hate everything about it. They hate how they were enslaved to it. They hate the industry that pushes it on them. They hate it that it's behind the counter, all these kinds of things. Whereas the rest of us are kind of like, but they, it's, it's so raw to them. But it's that way with the repentant sinner. They hate the shame that they brought on themselves, and they hate everything about it. I can think of um, not quitting cigarettes, mm-hmm. but um, I know a young lad that we're both very familiar with who was in a relationship that we didn't agree with, and just how shameful he felt mm-hmm. after the fact. And, right. and, um, and then how angry he was at the way the whole thing played out. Right. And so I, I feel that that's very similar oh, right. to that. Just going, I cannot believe I did this wrong thing mm-hmm. for so long and you know, I was warned against it and I was told. Right. And then, and now I hate her. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah that's the idea is the, yeah. the just indignation at the whole situation that you yourself did. And it's not putting the blame on other people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's on yourself. Right. Um, fourth, what fear? Might, that might seem strange in this list, but what's what fear of God? It's, it's, it's like in a moment of clarity, you see the holiness of God, and you're awed by it. And, and there's something of, when the Bible talks about the fear of God, I, I, I knew a man one time who did a... Um, a dissertation on the fear of God. And so we asked him, well, what does it mean to, f- to fear the Lord? And he said, it means to fear the Lord. <laughs> it's like they're giving you a degree for this, you know. But there is something about fearing the Lord which just ultimately includes fear because God is awesome and, um, and holy and different. And great. And to recognize the offense that you have before a holy God has an effect on you. So what longing? Um, you have a longing for restored relationships. I've had this broken relationship with God. I've had this broken relationship with my parents, and I want to heal that. Or this broken relationship with my friend, and I want to restore that. Anything I can do to make this relationship better, uh, what zeal, we already talked about love for God and equal hatred of his enemies. And lastly, um, what avenging of wrong, justly setting things in order. I, I, just, I just want things to be set right the, the way they should be. I don't want things to be out of, out of order any, anymore. But these are the things that um, Paul saw in his report from Titus about the believers in Corinth. And he rejoiced over this because in this is evidence of their repentance. Um, And he says, and this is kind of an interesting uh, sentence here in, in, in chapter, in verse 12, 
and it's kind of it's kind of um, Hebrew in its in its in its logic of of kind of using um, the transition. For, so although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the defended, but so that and so it kind of has a it's first he says what it's not for, anyways. But he didn't write. He's saying, I didn't write this so that this guy who confronted me, it wasn't to get back and punish him. That's not why I wrote, that's not why I wrote the severe letter to you. Also, why I wrote to you was not for my own personal feelings, because my feelings got hurt, and because I, I, want, I, want, I want to make myself look better. So that, that's not why I wrote to you. But this is kind of an interesting statement so that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. Interesting. Think of it like this. I know that you love me. I know that you received my word and that you believed in the Lord Jesus and trust in him for your final salvation. But since I left, you've become so covered up with sin and with lies and with falsehood, and you've been led astray by these people. And I want to strip all of that away so that you can see, once again, that you can see for yourselves how that you actually do love me and believe me. Isn't that interesting? An interesting way to say it. I know that you do, but you've forgotten that you have. You've forgotten that you trust me and that you love me. And so we're going to get rid of all this junk, and you're going to see it for yourselves. What a beautiful way to write it. For this reason, we've been comforted. So the news from Titus and the way Titus um, himself was rejoicing over their repentance brought Paul great joy. This um, very much was a source of rejoicing for him. And because the thing is, Paul had told Titus um, that they were going to repent. He told Titus, they're genuine, they're real. I know it doesn't seem like it. I know, boy, you, when you talk about all the problems we listed out in, in 1 Corinthians, all the divisiveness, and all the, they're still going to, to, um, to pagan temples, they're still going to prostitutes, and they don't know what to do. They have broken relationships between the husband and wife, and all the uh, screwed up things that they're doing at the Lord's table, and, and Titus knew all these things, and he's saying, saying, Paul, I don't know if these people are real or not. He says, I know they're real. I know they're genuine. They will repent. Eventually, they will repent. And so, but Paul sends Titus, and he's, he's, he's going to be kind of shameful on him if Titus comes back and goes, nope, they, 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 still, they, they still don't want anything to do with you. Paul's going to look pretty dumb. And so he says, he says, no, I was not ashamed. Our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. And his affection abounds more and more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all and how you received him with fear and trembling. And this is, this is Paul here speaking like a southerner saying, the obedience of y'all. So, because that's really the last point of repentance, isn't it? Is obedience. That repentance that doesn't result in some degree of obedience is not going to be genuine um, repentance. Um, genuine repentance results in submission to the Word of God. This is without, without qualification, without reluctance. This is not dragging your feet. Okay, I guess I'll do this. You know, I, for some reason, this, this kind of reminds me of, um, and you remember the parable of the man who finds the, uh, the treasure in the field and uh, that Jesus told, it was a very, very short parable that man, man finds this uh, treasure buried in a field and he goes and he sells everything that he has and what does he do with the money that he, that he buys the field so that he gets the treasure. And... Um, and I remember thinking how stupid it would be because he, 
in order to get the money to buy the field, he has to sell everything he has. But, but what, if, what if when he was selling everything that he had, he's weeping over it? Oh, this is Aunt Polly's teapot. I can't believe I have to sell this. No, he was rejoicing. Rejoicing while he was selling everything. Give me the money so I can buy the field. Because it's worth more than everything. Everything that I've got. And that's the way repentance is. Is that it joyfully leaves the old life behind. There's joy in that. And I rejoice in everything that I have confidence in you. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the capstone to the whole point of repentance here, is that in the end, the pastor has confidence in them. And this is kind of an interesting word for confidence here, and, and, and it kind of has to do with, um, it's, it's a pretty severe renewal of trust. This is kind of like the, uh, the, the confidence that one soldier has in another. I would be willing to fight side to side with you. That's the confidence I have in you, that you are not going to abandon me, that you are going to fight the good fight along my side, that I have your back and you have mine. Boy, if you have anybody you have confidence in like that, that's a, you have a good thing. Same conclusion for chapter 7. Um, these three points. God comforts the lowly, doesn't he? Um, this grieving pastor who had these broken relationships that were very hard on his heart and, um, his, and his mind, but God comforted him. Um, but as I say here again, without repentance, there is no salvation. And... Um, we could talk about that more sometime if, if, if you know, if they could. But, there are, but I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people out there right now that um, are trying to preach a gospel that doesn't include confrontation of sin, that doesn't include repentance. But, um, but if it doesn't include repentance from sin, it, it, it's not genuine. It's not going to lead to genuine faith. Because you cannot have both. You can't have allegiance with sin and allegiance with Christ. And lastly, I thought it was an interesting quote from John MacArthur. We all like to call the nation to repentance. But who's going to call the church to repentance? Um, if the Lord were, were to return today, the first place that he would come to for judgment would be the house of God. And, that, and that's um, definitely true that, that the American church needs to repent. That's the, the problem with the United States um, doesn't start in D.C. It starts in the hearts of the people that need to come um, and repent before a holy God. Let me close this in prayer. Dear Father God, we, we thank you for um, all the blessings that we have in Christ. We thank you that you have um, uh, sown repentance in our hearts, God, not only at the initial conversion, but God, um, we kind of uh, live our daily lives in, in, a, in a state of repentance, of always, always um, turning our back on our sin and, and hating our sin and um, trusting you to, uh, to rescue us from it. And Father, I pray that you, would, um, that you would soften our hearts to receive these words with joy and to um, just uh, glorify you with our lives. And Father, we pray for this morning's worship that your name and your word would be lifted up above all things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.